So the question of Afrocentricity uh, is actually an intellectual question and it's a practical question. It's an intellectual question because it deals with a philosophical orientation to African people in Africa, in the Caribbean, and in the Americas uh, in a way that until Afrocentricity came into being as a theoretical construct, uh, it was always hit and miss. In other words, there were some people who were uh, doing uh, work and research, and they were looking at ideas, uh, sometimes from the standpoint of African people, but often from the standpoint of European people looking at African people. So uh, in the 1970s, in the late 1970s, it occurred to me, uh, at this time I was uh, head of the Department of Communication at the State University of New York in Buffalo, and it occurred to me that the way we were looking at our own situation as African people, we were looking at that situation as if we were marginal to Europe. In other words, we were on the periphery of Europe. Uh, it's interesting that two of uh, the famous uh, African-American historians of a couple of decades earlier had written a book uh, which was called uh, America The Negro History in Our History. And Negro too. And I always thought that that was interesting, that these two black historians, uh, considered at the time among the best of our historians, uh, would write a book in which they would see us as marginal. So Afrocentricity uh, sees itself, or rather, or came into being, I should say, as a view that said that African people were subjects of human history, that we were at the very beginning human history, and that if you examine any detail of African life, you must see the African as an agent, as an actor, not merely as they acted upon. And I understand what the problem was. The problem was because during the enslavement of Africans, uh, for in the U.S., uh, 246 years, and during the enslavement of Africans longer than that in Brazil and in Jamaica, for example, you had this idea that we were only important because of Europe and that there was nothing that African people did that was a subject position. We were always objects. We were always victims. And it's the rejection of the notion of negation of African people that constituted the very origins of Afrocentricity. The idea behind Afrocentricity was that it was an intellectual idea in which African people viewed themselves, and we insist must be viewed as actors, as subjects, as central to our own historical phenomena. And if we are central to our own historical phenomena, if we are indeed players and actors and participants, then what we say, what we do, matters. There's an interesting expression uh, from the 1960s uh, that uh, uh, Mahalana Karenga, one of the great philosophers of our era, once uh, expressed, and that was that after he had given a speech, the people asked, no, why do you say what you said? He said, I said what I said, and we express this, and we do this, because we say so. And this whole notion of what do we say was a notion that for many years had really agitated me. It was like, okay, we know what the Europeans say. We, we may even know something about what some Asians say, but we don't know what Africans say. What do Africans believe? What will Africans die for? What will Africans live for? What have Africans ever thought about Anything, science, humanities, art, uh, aesthetics, philosophy, and these were the questions that really, I think, spurred and sparked the energy of the 1970s and 80s and 90s in which African people decided that, you know what, we are no longer going to view ourselves as on the periphery of Europe. We're going to investigate uh, our own uh, historical experiences 
and there is nothing greater for us than our own historical experiences. We're going to interrogate our own intellectuals. We're going to interrogate our own uh, spiritual and religious traditions. We're going to interrogate our political contributions to the world. And we're going to ask the question, where did philosophy come from in the first place? We're, we're not junior brothers or junior sisters to the world. And in 1980, when I wrote the book, Afrocentricity, The Theory of Social Change, it was precisely because this was a thing that uh, activated my own mind was how is it possible that we could have uh, so many millions of African people living in the Americas and the Caribbean, living on the continent of Africa, and we never uh, ask the question, uh, what is in our best interest? Uh, what, can, what can we add or contribute to this? How do we come back on the stage of human history and take our place once again as we had once taken our place on the on the basis of human uh, on the basis of humanity. Uh, how can we now do this and contribute again to the world? These were questions. And in Afrocentricity, the theory of social change, I articulated a position that said that uh, if we look at all of our examples in the American context, because that was what I knew at that time, whether you looked at the nation of Islam, whether you looked at the Marxists, the Hebrew Israelites, whether you looked at Kawa Ida, whatever you looked at, the civil rights movement, all people tended to have the same analysis of what our situation was. And the answers, the solutions were different, but the analysis was the same that basically African people have been decentered, dislocated, and moved off of our own terms. We were not just moved off of our terms physically. It's not just that we were moved from Africa uh, to the Americas. It, it, it's more than that. Uh, if it were only that, then in Africa we would find people who would automatically be Afrocentric. But we discovered that in Africa you also have people who do not have an Afrocentric consciousness. So what we decided then was that it was possible for people to have Africanity, that is, to wear African clothes, to have African cooking, even to use an African language and yet be Eurocentric in their orientation, in their consciousness. And so what we decided, what I decided in writing Afrocentricity was that I would write Afrocentricity as a lover's book. This was the book written as a lover to African people. That this is the way we change our situation. This is the way we transform our situation. If somebody asks a question about beauty, about goodness, about uh, health, about uh, religion, about art, then the very first thing we have to do is to interrogate our own historical experiences because they are just as valuable and just as important as any historical experiences in the world. So Afrocentricity was that kind of book. Now the name Afrocentricity was not mine. It didn't come from me. That name, Afrocentricity, is something that emerged out of the work of uh, Kwame Nkrumah. He was the first one that I had read about because in the 1960s he had called for, at the University of Ghana, Legon, he had called for an Afrocentric uh, uh, educational experience. And so it was out of that that a number of other people uh, start using the term. But what I tried to do was to give the term substance and a theoretical idea and a basis for us to use it as a guide or as a, a, a critical uh, tool for analysis. And that's why Afrocentricity has been such a powerful concept. Uh, and I think that perhaps alongside negritude, uh, Afrocentricity is the most uh, widespread uh, intellectual uh, idea that's derived from uh, African people in the 20th century. And I, I say negritude as widespread, and I realize that uh, there have been uh, many people who have problematized uh, negritude. But Afrocentricity itself, uh, you find that uh, many of the works of some of the leading uh, African thinkers 
uh, have been described as Afrocentric, even though some of these people have never said that they were Afrocentric. But uh, Sheikh Antijouk, for example, uh, may have done some work that was Afrocentric, but he was essentially one of our greatest historians and anthropologists. So I always tell people, I, I, don't, I, I knew uh, Sheikh Antijouk. I met Sheikh Antijouk. Uh, and uh, Sheikh Antijouk never uh, said that he was an Afrocentrist, and yet uh, much of his work is Afrocentric. And I think the part of uh, the reason that people don't, didn't necessarily accept was because the terminology was not in existence, at least within his context. And I think this is true with a lot of people. I mean, certainly uh, what we have discovered now is that it is a widespread term. When you talk about African Renaissance, most people understand that you can't have Renaissance unless you have some uh, notion of critical consciousness, critical self-consciousness that African people see themselves as agents of change and transformation. And if we see ourselves as agents of change and transformation, it, it means that we have uh, achieved a level of, uh, of, of awareness of our own ability and our own capability that we have never before seen and we have never before experienced. This is the radical change that has to come about internationally in the African world, and it allows us to establish uh, the organization uh, that was started by me and Dr. Amal Mazama, the Afrocentricity International, because Afrocentricity International is a worldwide African organization about consciousness and about awareness and about African people seeing themselves uh, as centered to our own historical experiences. Uh, this is the important thing. So the notion of Afrocentricity is a fundamental notion, and my books, The Afrocentric Idea, and uh, An Afrocentric Manifesto, and Kemet Afrocentricity and Knowledge, as well as the book, the first book, Afrocentricity, are critical to an understanding, an in-depth understanding of this fundamental uh, philosophical idea.